So this episode has two purposes. One, I want you to get to know Francis Sambato from Ghana, Africa. He's a great guy, wonderful young family. He is uh, providing for them, trying to provide for them, pro- providing for his siblings. His parents passed away, and he does a wonderful work in the church and in the community there in Ghana. Secondarily, I want you to learn about him because I have a fundraiser to help him build a fish farm so he can provide for his family, provide for his siblings, and help the community. I know several people that have known him for many years and are close family friends of his. He's a great member of the church, a hundredth, a hard worker where he gives 100% to everything he does. He does all he can to create a better life for his family and those around him. He's trying to break the cycle of poverty in his family. So I'm going to provide a link for the GoFundMe project of Francis Sabato's fish farm here in the description box, as well as on a card that's going to pop up here. And if you can do anything, $5, $10 or more, You'll be helping out a great member of the church and and someone who's trying to lead his family. I really hope that some of you can help him out here. Here we go. All right, welcome to Quick Show. My name is Greg Matson, and I am your host. In this episode, we've brought on Francis Sombato from Ghana, Africa. Francis, welcome to the show. Uh, Thank you so much, Greg. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity uh, given to me at this time. I'm so grateful to be in this big platform, and I'm so excited for this opportunity. Great. So you're a member of the church, Francis. I want to talk a little bit about your background and kind of what's going on with the church here today. But let's start with your background. Um, Are your parents members of the church? Um, actually, my mom was the first person who joined the church, and uh, she joined the church in 2000 and I think 2006. That's when she joined the church. And so as soon as she joined the church, and then she also invited me um, to also to join the church. And so my mom, my mom, she was a member, but she has passed away when I was on the on my mission field. That is when my mom passed away. My dad, my dad wanted to become a member, and but he was not able to make it, and he was he passed away. I think seven months time when my mom passed away. Wow. Um, but I have been able to do all the uh, the necessary thing that uh, he need for him. Okay, and so how many how many brothers and sisters do you have? Uh, actually, we are um, nine. Yeah, we are nine. And you all nine uh, we total have, brothers and sisters total. Uh, yeah, we have we have two sisters. I have two sisters. Two sisters and six brothers. Yes. Okay. All right. And and where do you fall in there? Are you toward the oldest or the youngest or? Um, somewhere middle. Somewhere <laughs> in the middle. Okay. All right. So <laughs> you you ended up. How old were you when you were baptized? I I was um, at the age of, I think, 15 or 16. Yeah. Okay. And you ended up going on a mission. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And you went to Nigeria, correct? Yeah, Nigeria for Talcott Mission. Okay. So tell us a little bit about the mission and what that meant to you. Uh, actually, um, the mission is like, for me, actually, the mission is everything to me because, um, you know, even when I joined the church as a young age, when I joined the church, um, there's something that um, I, I noticed that I lack those things. But uh, being in the mission field, there is this special treasure in the mission field. And one thing that I, I discovered on the mission field was I discovered that if I allow myself for the mission to pass through me, I will come out as a great person. But if I don't allow myself for the mission to pass through me, I will, I will come back home and it will be hard for me 
and I will not understand the principles and the doctrines that the church teach. And so mission is something that is very a treasure thing for me. Actually, it has really changed my life. And and it is it is something that I really appreciate making that boldly decision to to serve the Lord for 24 months. So I am so grateful that I had that opportunity to to serve mission. So in in Ghana, what, you, you speak English. Did you learn English as a kid? Okay, so the, um, yeah, it's an English speaking country, but most most of the people, let me say, most Ghanaians speak. We they have different languages, but the most popular language is Twi, which is T W I Twi. That is how the Americans pronounce it, Twi. But we okay. pronounce it as tree. Okay, so that is the most popular language. Everybody can speak the tree. But apart from that, I'm from the northern side of Ghana. My dad, my mom, they are from the northern side of Ghana. They speak a different language. And but the tree is the um, like a language that everybody can speak. That's the most popular language that everybody can speak. Okay. So, so you come I learned your mission and and you're married and you have kids, right? So yeah. you're taking on the responsibility of being a husband and a father at this point. Uh, how many kids do you have? Right now, I have three girls. We have three girls. And okay. the, oldest is, uh, the oldest is Jesse. And the second one is called Arian. We'll name her after Arian Cybert. And um, the last one is called Roseanne. And we are expecting another one. <laughs> You're expecting number four? Yes. Well, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me what life is like for you in Ghana. And, and kind of what is your daily routine? What do you do uh, to be productive, you know, uh, to be a husband and a father? What, what is life like for you in Ghana? Okay, so life over here is, let me say, it's pretty hard um, because um, there is no much opportunities. And like in this channel, I know it's not for um, politics, but um, life here is, you know, to be able to put food in the table, it takes a lot. And a lot of people doesn't earn much. And as a father, uh, that is why I said um, I'm grateful that I said mission. And there are certain things I learned on mission, such as budgeting. I learned those things on the mission field. And I learned how to manage um, everything on, on the mission field. So um, it is not easy to, to be able to even to find a job. Uh, even when you completed uh, university, there are a lot of people who have completed university, but they are home. They can't find a job. And it's all because of one thing, corruption. Corruption is something that it is high when you come to Africa as a whole, and most, of, most especially in West Africa. Um, it is hard. It is, it is really hard um, to, to live here and to be able to wake up in the morning and to be able to find food, um, it, it is something that you should thank Heavenly Father for, for him providing for your family. And that is one of the things that um, a lot of Ghanaians, whenever I speak, I don't speak for myself only, but I speak because um, there are a lot of people out there um, that they go through a lot of things. The things that I go through, there are people out there that they go through, and then it is not easy. It is not easy. When I say it is not easy, it is not. And I remember when Erin Erin Syred, when she came to Ghana in 2019, um, even our hospitals, um, it is it is terrible. Mm. It is terrible. Um, it is not even even if you have even if you have. It is 
it is something that is really hard because everything goes for the politicians. Everything goes for people who have. Um, so over here, even though we live in our own country, but sometimes we feel like we are slaves in our own country because everything go for the politician and the rich people. Yeah. Okay. They keep control of things. Did you, did you, was it similar in Nigeria when you were there? It's similar. It's, it's, it is not easy. Yeah. Uh, when we talk about poverty, it is real. Um, I, I had an opportunity to start um, a nonprofit organization, and that is one of the things that brought uh, Aryan Cybert to Ghana. And Greg, um, it is hard. It is really hard. Okay. So yeah. you have now got something where I, I believe you're you're trying to you've started a fish farm. Yep. Right. Yep. What do you want to do yep. with that? Okay, so what I want to do with the fish farm, because um, I, there's one thing that I, I noticed, uh, because in eight years, from eight years with this new government, there is something I noticed that um, this new government, um, every year they close the sea. And when they close the sea, which means the fishermen, where I live, is close to the, uh, the ocean, so in this town, they do a lot of fishing in this town. So one thing I, I noticed is every year the government closed the sea and the fish, the fisherman doesn't go to the sea for three good months. And so and sitting down and thinking about this, um, because when they close the sea, uh, fish become a high demand for people to, to, pay, uh, to purchase like the prices go up. And so for I, when I said that, I, for me to be able to solve some of this um, problem, it's for me to be able to come out with this idea and to be able to um, I start with a fish farm so I can be able to sell some of this fish. And some is also going to be used in the home. And some is also going to give. We are going to give some to the community, the homes that they, they don't have money to even to buy fish. So that is the whole idea. Okay. And and you've got it started already. How much larger are you trying to make it? Um, I'm trying because right now I have um, the first batch, I have 200 pieces. And because the pond is, the pond was a little, so some of the fish, they struggle inside the pond. So I lost um, some of the fish. Some die, and so right now uh, the old one that the, I started, those one I have 117 fish. But recently I brought um, four, I think 400 um, new fingerlings. But I'm looking forward to be able to have whereby I can have 5,000, 10,000 fish. Okay. Um, so let's go back to your family here. So you've got your three daughters. You've got another child coming. Uh, yeah. How old's your oldest daughter? Uh, she's five years. She's five. So does she go to school yet? Yes. Okay. She goes to school. And yeah. do most kids go to school there? Okay. So most most people... Uh, most children doesn't go to school when when you come here in Africa. Even though the government has made it in a way that is it's free education, but the problem is most of the parents cannot afford certain something like a textbook or exercise book, pencil, school uniform. Most of the parents cannot afford. And most of these parents also doesn't have, even when their kids is going to school, they don't even have like food to give them. Even though the government has made it in a way that um, they sometimes provide food for the children. But I tell you that if you see some of this food that they give it to the children, I don't think they will give those food to their own children. It's because this parent 
doesn't most of the parent doesn't have so a lot of children doesn't go to school so when you come to ghana when you are in the street you see a lot of children in the street and most of these children are whether they are in their, in their streets begging or some of these children has been used as child labor and most of these children is being um uh, sold for child labor that happens a lot in the Bota lake that is the biggest um, lake in, in, I think, in, in West Africa. Yeah, mm. I think one of the biggest lake. And so most, most children have been sold into the, this lake. And the fishermen over there, they buy these children. And then they use these children for fishing. And so that is some of the things that is it, going in over here. And most children, in fact, most children doesn't go to school. Most of the school. Okay. Do you, how, 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 cl- where do you go to church? Do you, how far is the building to go to church or do you go in a home or where do you meet for church? Okay. So from my home to where the church is, is about an hour and 40 minutes. An hour and 40 minutes. And how do you get there? <laughs> so at times we walk. At times when we have money, we, we, we charter a car. It's called a taxi. And so we'll call the driver. And then when the driver comes, they charge a certain amount, which is about um, $1 or $2. And then they, they take us and then bring us back. Okay. And how many, you know, roughly about how many people are in that meeting when you, when you go? Like in your um, sacrament. You know, and our, our sacrament meeting, sometimes we have like 130, 140, but the membership is over, over 100 and, 130. And do you see a lot of growth in your area there? A lot of, a lot of people being baptized? Yes, a lot, of, a, lot of people, a lot of people have been baptized, a lot, a lot. Yeah. Well, well Africa is obviously one of the biggest growth areas for the church, <laughs> which yes. is wonderful. And uh, Ghana is one of specifically one of those countries that is really growing yes. a lot in the church. Um, can you see as you go to church and you see what's taught and you have the gospel there and self-reliance that's taught and all these things, do you think that there can be a change in the living conditions that you have there because of the spread of the gospel there? Yeah, so... I think the gospel is indeed, it's truly, the gospel is really happening <laughs> because, you know, over here, like, people really, really, really love God. That is the truth. And so even if it's somebody is dying, they have put their trust in God. They believe that it's only God that is going to save them. Like, it is like me when I was growing up. There are times that my, 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 I saw my mother because there was no food. And it was a small food, and my mother had to leave it for us. And yeah, the only thing that she said is he knows, she knows that God will provide. And so over here, people really love God. And people can do anything for God. Yeah. So they're, they're, the, the humility of the circumstances, I think, automatically help people grow closer to God. Yes. Whereas in the West, where I'm at, right, where we have a lot more um, luxury and abundance and all these things, it's, it's a lot easier over here to forget God. And, and that happens quite a bit. So when over this side, I wish I wish one day you will come here and see certain things for yourself. You can see where somebody lives, and maybe when you contact Erin Cyrus, if you have a time, you contact her. She can tell you. She can tell you most of the things when she came here she saw. But all these people, they they are. They have hope in the Lord, and they have hope in God, and they trust in God, no matter the condition. 
no matter the condition, they still trust in God. And that is one thing that moves the people over here. That is one thing that always keeps them moving. No matter how hard it will be, they always trust in God. They, they know that one day God will, you know, put some smile in their face. And some people doesn't even leave to see that. Such like my mom. She, growing up, like I saw my mom moving and my dad moving from one place to another because we never have our own house. And today I have my own house and I, I wish she lived to see that his son, it, maybe they never believed that maybe any of their son or one day even build, build a home. But I wish she lived to be able to see that it is possible and everything that she was hoping for. And I know it is little by little. And at times it is, it is noisy, but I know wherever she is now, she can see that what she was hoping for. The Lord is truly, she's doing it little by little. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you have a YouTube channel. Yeah. Uh, obviously you had a great experience on your mission and this is probably why you, you, you name this, the YouTube channel is called time with the missionaries. Yeah. So, so what is that about and why do you put that channel together? Okay. So time with missionaries always, it started from when I joined the church when my mom introduced me to the missionaries, because as a young boy, there are things that I love so much. I love playing football. I love dancing. And so anytime the missionaries come, I, when, when I give them the time, because they don't come in the right time, and I also give them the wrong time all the time. And so sometimes I'll give them around three, because when they, around three, the sun, there is no sun, the sun, there is no sun, it's not hot. And that is the best time to play football. And so whenever they come, in those days we have this kind of windows. And those windows, some people still have those windows. And it's easy to jump. I can go inside and tell them I'm going to bring my pamphlet. And I will jump from the window and then I will go and play football. And one day... When I, as soon as I jumped the window, one of the missionary, he heard me and he was like, Brother Francis, I know the gospel is not by force, but I know that this gospel is re really going to help you. And so he sat me down and he, he taught me the plan of salvation. And one of the things that I noticed from this missionary is that he, he know how to preach football. And so I wanted to learn the football from the missionary. So every P day, they used to invite me to the apartment because they have a, a huge compound where they play football every P day. So every P day, he would invite me to, to follow them and go and play soccer with them. And so by the time I knew, I was following the missionaries from 2007. That is when I got baptized. By the time I know, I was following the missionaries post lighting. And I, from 2007, and that year in December 29, when I was baptized, from that day, I continued to post light with missionaries. I continued to help missionaries. I watched missionaries like, right, missionaries from the West, sometimes when they come, because over here we use our hand, we don't have washing machines. It is here, but it, a lot of people cannot afford. So most people use their hand to wash. And when you come, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, they can bring a large quantity of clothes and you have to use your hand to wash. So I was doing those things for the missionaries that are from Idaho, America, I was doing that. I was doing that for them. So every Monday, I'll go to the apartment and watch for them, post light with them. So I keep on post lighting with the missionaries until 
2013, when one mission president, uh, his name was um, uh, his uh, his name was uh, I forgot his name, but he in 2013 he called me as a stake missionary because he saw that I used to post life with the missionaries a lot. So he called me as a stake missionary. And he sent me to an area in, in the Western region, which is uh, somewhere closer to where I live. So he sent me to that place to serve over there for two months because they were short of missionaries. And when I came back home, I continued to post life with the missionaries until the day, that was in 2014, when I received my mission call. And so when I was starting this YouTube channel, I said, let me name it Time with the Missionaries. For me to remember that they are, the missionary work is indeed divine. And the time that I spend with all these missionaries. And one day, I want my children to also to know when they ask me, as like the way you are asking me about what is this channel it's all about. It's all centered in the service that I did, with the work that I did with the missionaries in all those years. And that is the reason why I named this YouTube channel Time with the Missionaries. Awesome. Great story. Well, Francis, thank you so much for your time on this. I know uh, it's so hard. It's you have a you have a difficult circumstance. You you grow up in a difficult area. Um, there is not much there, not much opportunity in, in that land, but I know the gospel changes hearts and minds. And, and the more that that gospel is spread in that area and it is spreading quickly, that there can be change and opportunity that, that can come to the people. But I really appreciate your example. I appreciate your humility. I appreciate your sacrifice. I know you also take care of a number of things for your, your large family, your brothers and sisters as well. And so uh, you've got a lot on your shoulders and that's, that's a lot to carry. Yeah. But uh, if you're staying close to the Lord, I think, I think you can bear those burdens. So, but I appreciate your example of actually taking on that responsibility, right? That's, that's, that's a big deal. Thank you for your time so much. And, and friend, we'll, we'll talk again soon. All right. Thank you so much. Hello. Goodbye, my fish. Fish. This is the dream I'm talking about. This is something I'm wishing to be able to have something like this. This is somebody fish pond I visit today. And you can see how amazing everything looks like. This is the vision, this is what I want to become. And this is what I'm, I'm praying that I can be able to get the support. This is all fish ponds over here. So beautiful. This a uh, standing pipes on you can see the way the water is rotating it's so amazing yeah, it's yeah. Then, so see how amazing it is this all this uh, investment so when I tell you that invest on fish farming, you may think that we are joking. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel once again. And this is Francis Zumbato. I am so happy and whenever I come here, I feel so blessed. I feel so humbled to work here and to encourage somebody out there that hey it is not too late do you think it's too late it is never too late you can start something